Welcome back to the Film Alchemist Podcast, the show where we take the movies we love, break them apart, to find out what gives them their fleshy magic. I'm your host, Josh Griffey, here as always, joined by my friend, co-host, and guy with the tummy, Gina. <laughs> Alex Dandino. <laughs> All right. Uh, it is officially the month of December, and our, our listeners know that every December we stuff your stockings. This entire month has been programmed by our, our friends over on Patreon. That's right, patreon.com slash filmalchemistpod. The best way to make your voice heard, the best way to make the show exactly what you want and deserve. Uh, again, all of them got uh, got in the drawing to get their movies for this month. You get to vote on our uh, Patreon-exclusive library, which is ever-growing and amazing. We have many series. We've got feature commentaries, uh, all kinds of good stuff. We work really hard to try to make that worth your time. So if you'd be so kind, patreon.com slash filmalchemistpod, the best way to support the show. We appreciate it so much. Uh, the email, filmalchemistpod at gmail.com. We're on whatever social media exists uh, by the time you hear this. Uh, the YouTube is Film Alchemist if you want to see our faces. Also, make sure you're leaving five-star ratings and uh, reviews anywhere and everywhere you find the show. All right. It's time to get your fleece tickled uh, in a, a Patreon stocking stuffer here. Uh, so our friend Taryn, having a great month. You probably just heard Taryn's uh, wonderful Jimmy Stewart double feature as part of her Patreon rewards. Oh, yeah. And she won one of the coveted stocking stuffer slots with David Cronenberg's Videodrome. Uh, this is a movie that I fucking loved in college. I watched this movie all the time. It's bizarre. Uh, the effects are wonderful. It's shockingly funny to me. Um, I just, I can't say enough about how much I love this movie. So I'm going to let Alex start opening thoughts on Videodrome. You know, this is probably next to the fly, my favorite Cronenberg movie. Um, yeah? Yeah, like... And that's Over a scanners in the brood. That's a hard thing to say because yeah, uh, yeah like scanners in the brood are fucking incredible movies. Like, even rabbit, I think, is awesome. Like, like I think mine is the fly, then the brood. Yeah, like and then the fly the is up. the fly for me is like that's the that's the capper. Um, Videodrome, though, this is why is because where the brood does something, the brood follows the sort of much more. Tr what I think what I like about the brood is the. The Brood is a little more traditional storytelling. This is much deeper into what I think Cronenberg does best, which is um, the social thriller. Now, you wouldn't normally call it that because there's tummy ginas and like weird skin guns and yeah, dudes dick exploding. Guns. Like, dudes it's exploding very into sexual cancers. fleshiness, yeah. <laughs> like, there's a lot of weird shit going on, but like, this truly is one of like, this is 1983 and. I don't know. Like, there's a lot of parallels that we operate today. Like, there's whole scenes of things that are said in this movie. I'm like, Oof, that did not age well. Not in the way that, like, oh man, we shouldn't say that word anymore. But more like, well, that absolutely came true. Like, they weren't fucking off by a lot, right? Like, it just so wasn't TVs. Me, it was little handheld TVs, <laughs> right? But like, so, but Cronenberg just Cronenberg taps into this you know, social thriller aspect that makes us all sort of like look inward. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, there's this like awesome sci-fi psychosexual thing going on too, that makes it palatable for like, you know, weirdos like us. And then it becomes like a much more interesting movie <laughs> yeah. rather than just being a weird. So rather than just being spotlight, it's spotlight with tummy ginas. So yeah. <laughs> kidding, this kidding. Movie not spotlight eats spotlight. <laughs> For breakfast. This no, movie um, puts spotlight in its tummy gina and yeah. blows it up. Anyways, yes. And then doesn't but, rewind and gets a penalty. It's no, a truly um, a truly fascinating movie to me. Right. Well, because I think one of the things, Cronenberg obviously is very noted for his body horror and the effects in a lot of his movies are wonderful. This one does tap into these, these extra elements that I think make it really fascinating, right? One is, like you said, there is this whole societal aspect, right? Right as TV's becoming uh, more consuming, right? Right as we're hitting the home video market. 
and we're beginning to ask ourselves, how much of ourselves are we giving to this fucking TV? And besides just the yucks you get sitting around after dinner, right, and watching, what are the long-term consequences of this device? This device lives in our house, and it dictates a lot of our lives, right? It's, and you you extrapolate that out, right, beyond the, the home video and subterranean market that they talk about in this. Right, right. But you look at it, something today. We've all had that experience where you're like, man, I need to go to bed. And then you're like, fuck, I was you on TikTok watch. for three hours. Yeah, you just watch. And your brain your phone, is just shutting TV, off. yeah. The you're algorithm not, is just hijacking your brain. Right. You're not actively watching anything. You're just no. watching. And what is the consequence of injecting four or five hours of whatever into your head every day where you're not actively engaging with it? It's right. just getting in there and doing it's just whatever. information that's literally just placed in your brain for no, to go nowhere. It is right. literal junk food in your brain. Right. And this, this movie takes kind of the old-timey approach of, if we watch bad things, it's going to make us bad people in society, yeah, which is, I don't, but it, but it is an interesting idea. Know, and then on top of that, you layer, well, you layer the idea of where the, this blurred lines thing, right? So beyond the Marilyn Manson causes school shootings or whatever, right? Yeah. Which is, if you get beyond that, right? Yeah. You, you take out the dangerous art makes us dangerous, right? They mm -hmm. kind of eschew that by saying it's it's not even about what it makes us do but the fact that it becomes an integral part of our reality yeah. and blurring the lines can be different right so this one becomes essentially video drome is a political weapon yeah these people create this this video project right that on its surface is a snuff film right it's it's people mm -hmm. getting beaten and tortured and murder and in you know weird sexual dungeons and for those of you who watch it, there is a signal that hijacks your brain and creates a tumor and or the new flesh right. that is, is jump-starting our evolution or causing the destruction of degenerates, right? Right. So it has this, this brilliant mix of rooted in reality, extrapolated out into a sci-fi nightmare. And then the thing I think that is really interesting about this one is as you're watching it, you as the viewer have to decide what are the real moments that Max Wren is experiencing – and what is the video drome of mine per se? Right. And I mean, I think that that's again, part of what makes this movie different from a lot of the other Cronenbergs that I would put as like number two, you know, mm -hmm. and what makes video drome special to me is that there is no concrete answer and it's very specific to the viewer. And I think, again, this goes to like, it's this very meta piece on what it is that we consume, like mm -hmm. us as consumers. And this is 1983, but it's prevalent through now, which is we as consumers consume, you know, we, we, we take so much in, there's so much crap that we are, there's so much crap we're ingesting mm -hmm. at all times. What of it is quote unquote dangerous is it dangerous and if it is right. dangerous if it's considered dangerous is it considered dangerous for everyone or is it just a few people because like i think that's another thing about the idea of that consumerism is is necessarily is it a is it a broad spectrum of evil you know what i mean like it's not right. necessarily bad like and it's not necessarily here's a, this is what I, this is how i'd put it it's not necessarily a bad thing to watch something and get all horned up. That's, you know, perfect. God, normal. I hope not. <laughs> that's, that, you know, that's what pornography is. That's, that's for yeah. all of us. But that I think is like that, but that's the question that the whole movie asks right. is like, what exactly is this? Well, at the end, asking, right. When, when for. Brian Corvex, right. The, the mastermind who's revealed that the fucking optometrist who's revealed to be this fucking political agent. Right. Right. He right. asked Max <laughs> Rennie's like, why did you search this out? Why did you need to find this? Because Max Wren, played by James Wood in a perfectly suitable scumbag role, right, mm -hmm. is a guy who runs this really small television studio that specializes in snuff, pushing the lines, right? So whereas we see this yeah. this Dionysus play, which is softcore porn, or when he does the deal for the Japanese show at the start, and it's very softcore, right? Yeah, yeah. They're in the meeting, and he he's just saying he's like, "I'm just looking for something that I'm will looking break for the through. next thing. I'm looking something for the thing, thing to push it." Yeah. Right. And he, he, he knows that there is only so far, right? That he needs to go further to compete, right? As he says, he has to show things that no one else will show because that's what keeps him in business. The okay. movie then asks us, is that really why Max Wren is doing this? Right? Because when we meet 
uh, the the lady who's on the talk show with him, right? Uh, who is it? Debbie Harry plays that act. Debbie Harry, yeah, yeah. So by the time we meet her, right, she is this kind of physical limit pusher, right? And he sees it in real life, and is when she like burns her tit with the the you yeah. know cigarette. He's like, oh. So there is this. And interesting, she's not ready for it, right? Because he, you know, she's like, I was built for video drum. He's like, baby, ain't no yeah, one built for that stay show. Stay out of there. Like, that's like right. a huge thing. Because that's the thing. He loves to watch it. But when it is put into his physical area, right? That here's this woman who would do these video drum acts with him in his living room if he so chooses. Right. right. And when he won't, she's going to go seek it out. So by seeing the women from that show, not just as, you know, props. But seeing this woman that he has a bond with in his own home, we are again blurring the lines, right? Because right. he even says that. He's like, why would they? Because, you know, when the lady's like, this is real, you need to leave it alone. And he goes, right. why would it be real? Why? It's so much easier to fake it. And she goes, because this show has something you don't, a philosophy, right? It's, it's a real, they are, they are trying to push us. Videodrome is ty- trying to rub our faces in what we want. And as we learn at the end, it is this fucking deviant we- a spider web, right? Yeah. And so Max Ren having to confront that reality, right, through Debbie Harry. And then obviously as the fucking new flesh is growing in his mind, it it is kind of asking us what is our part, right? Because just because I watched that tape, right, that doesn't mean that I have any part of that. I didn't help fucking make that. I'm right. not putting that out in the world. But right. I am providing the eyeballs that then have someone create that because they know someone wants to watch it. Right. It's an it's an interesting debate well, I mean, that Max is fighting the whole movie. Yeah, it's this chicken or the egg thing when it comes to you know what commercial what commercial television is. Like mm-hmm. it's like, did you ask for it or did it show up on its own? Like right. when he's sitting there, yeah. Like I think the that Dionysus softcore porn discussion Jesus. with that like. Whatever that lady, like that lady's some strange performance, like a weird, like, I don't know, whatever that performance artist lady is. I can't think of her name right off the top of my head. Masha? But, Masha, I think. Masha. Well, no, Masha's the character's name. There's a woman that she felt uh. like she was based on, um, <laughs> who's like a performance artist. But either way, it doesn't matter. Neither here nor there. Right. Like, I was thinking about this, though, and to me, when she presents that as like, look, it's so sexy and like, it's so effortlessly sex Mm -hmm. like i think that's like the thing is now we're in this situation where they're like there is no effort required to seek out whatever dark annals of your mind you can think literally dark annals yeah somebody has literally put it on the goddamn internet already like this was also the boom of the vhs tape and then People were getting, you know, you could get any kind of porn you wanted. Yeah, I mean, bootlegs from anywhere. Were bootlegs. So there was a lot of fear in the air about what this kind of opening the gates would look at, right? Right. And there, there is a moment, right, when he's on that talk show with Professor Oblivion, and he's just talking about. He's like, "I am providing a place where people can see and do these things in a safe place, right? Better on the screen than in the streets," as he say. He sure. says, right. Sure, and sure. this movie is asking us how long can a person who's really going that far out, right? Like, we've probably all at some point in our life seen some shit, right? Like, mm-hmm. I remember when Faces of Death was coming out. It's like, you can see real dead bodies, right? Um, I remember I got that Hollywoodland DVD when it came out, right? The, like, murder mystery movie yeah, yeah. or whatever. The I think that's what thing? it was called. Yeah. But on the special features, they had the actual crime scene footage. Of them walking around with the dead bodies. I remember how fucking horrible that made me feel. Right? But at this stage of my life, I've seen so much shit that I wouldn't even blink an eye at that. Right. I think that that's... And that's what the movie is kind of addressing is also, like, it's it's sort of this interesting indictment of censorship as well. Because, like, this is, this is always something that's fascinating to me about, like, this era. Um, like, from the 70s up through, like, the 90s. Uh, like, up to the 90s of this era of Cronenberg movies, because all of these movies, by the way, were funded by the Canadian government. Like he made all his movies (laughs) starting with like, like, starting with with shivers and rabid. They were funded by the Canadian, like they were grants from the Canadian government. So like this movie itself is this indictment of censorship of what you're willing to like take and what you're willing to go for. Like it's almost this self-reflection of don't tell me what I can't, 
put up there. And that's where Cronenberg was at this point in his career. Is like, don't tell me what I can't show people. Because what I can show right. people is something that they probably see within themselves. And I think that's what makes right. Videodrome so compelling as opposed to maybe some of the other movies is that the thing you can see in yourself in Videodrome is all of us sit in front of the TV. All of us, not just sit in front of the TV, but consume mindlessly like you're talking about until we see that thing. Like we don't realize we've seen it until it shows up on the screen. It's the same thing I talk about with, you know, when I've worked with producers on TV shows, some of them just don't understand what they're asking for until they see it on the screen. And then they're like, Oh, that, that's what we were looking for. How come you didn't know, realize we were talking about that? It's like, because you can't understand what you're saying until you right. see it. That's what it is. Right. So once you see it, it especially when it's something like way. what Videodrome is showing, right? You. That's a completely there. There is this because what the movie's also saying, right? At one point, they even say why Videodrome is only dangerous to the kind of people that would find Videodrome. So in a way, it is also <laughs> like why do we need to censor like? My wife would never come across Videodrome and watch a second of that. Right. Right? So th there is also this, a guy like Max Wren, who by, as the movie begins, right, he's having more of a, not even just a mental battle with his fucking love, as he says, right, of this brilliant sicko who makes Videodrome, but it's, it's even manifesting physically, right? Like, there yeah. are scenes when he's essentially trying to fuck this TV, yes. right? And he's trying to put Videodrome into his actual physical stomach when his fucking stomach turns into a vagina yeah. that holds a gun and a tape. And so <laughs> there, there is this outward physical manifestation that I think is saying that Max Wren was going to find this one way or another, right? That Debbie right. Harry was a person who knew she needed it physically, right? Because when she's looking, he's like, I got some porn. She's like, sweet. Yeah. And he puts like, in cool. Videodrome and she's like, you know, to he's like, torture and murder ain't exactly sex. Right. And she says, says she's like, who? I don't mind. Yeah, says who? And so I think there is this element of this where it is this in, indictment on what we're willing to watch. But it also is saying that most people are not going to the fucking extremes of Videodrome. So is Videodrome really this societal threat? Or is it just going to fucking unmask the people that are, are going too far? So I don't think I mean, it is as, as fucking tyrannical is like we don't need to show stuff like this right but see and this is the other thing too though is like unmasking to me goes back to that puritanical thing like we're talking yeah. about this unmasking of like what we truly believe is you know like unmasking is not like what i'd say is it's almost accessing who you truly feel like you are it's a mirror like that, to yourself yes it's a mirror to yourself it's setting you free <laughs> in a lot of ways it literally is the new flesh like that's like there's so yeah like it's just some fucking weird shit to say but mm. there's so much to say within that one line of dialogue which is farewell to the old flesh you know like the the new like long live the new right. flesh like these items this iconography that we like love to repeat because it just sounds like some hardcore shit you say sometimes but it is also like so prevalent and fascinating within the context of the movie is you're like right i'm not this I'm not a Puritan. Like I am not someone who's just going to, I'm watching Videodrome that automatically deems that I am not just this like boring person. This sad, not this sad suburban person. square. Yeah. I'm not this suburban square. Like I'm accessing this part of me that's very different. So like, to me, what's interesting is like when we get into, um, the <laughs> doc, okay. And I appreciated it when he brought it up, like on the when they're doing the TV show, the interview show with Doctor Oblivion. He's like, "That's obviously not my name." Like, "Oh, you don't say." I could not have guessed well, that. Think on that though, right? That is the moment when he says, "Eventually, we will all have a name like this." Did you think about ourselves. like? Did you think about like Twitter and all this? Yeah. All these hand, yeah. My fucking I Xbox too. handle, anything Absolutely. you have, right? That presents you in some other way. But Absolutely. That, that's, that's the part the first too where I he talks of. about. That the the television screen has become a part of the actual brain architecture. Right, right. Right? That it is a part it is the retina of the mind's eye. And because right. it's built into our brain structure, that re TV is as real as our reality, right? Which I think a lot of us like to keep that fucking separation, right? Yeah. And so there there is this this idea, right? That uh 
we we never fucking know and that again is what makes video drum special when i watch my hardcores right <laughs> I turn that off and I assume it's not in there anymore, right? But this is saying, what if I'm also living in that reality as well at the fucking same time? I mean, and it, I it is even... a very Cronenberg thing because I think he often gets pegged as he makes very inhuman movies, right? Like there, there is not a lot of. Which is so weird. It's I, like. You know what? I think this is the one, though, where it is so hollow and devoid of the value of humanity. Right, like as I watch this movie, it is kind of this. We all have this reality that we hate. He talks about all the time. The world's a shithole in this movie, mm -hmm. and so that we so have devalued ourselves and our societies that Videodrome is the inevitability for us. Right, so whereas you know it starts off I by mean, saying only that... Max Renz will find this. Maybe this is where we're all going because we have fucking given up this this connection to reality and to other I feel humans like hollow is not the word though. Like I actually think this movie has a lot of, it's fucking very cold towards the humanity of the characters. But that's like, but that's the, but that's like what the, but that's what the movie's exploring. Right. Uh, the ex but it, the but exploration, they feel a little lab ratty, right? I mean, aren't we all, I mean, I'm not saying it's a negative, right? I'm just saying this no, is I'm kind not of the saying perfect you are either. forum what for I'm his, saying is his to me, <laughs> coldness to me it makes sense because like for me these characters being let's say archetypal rather than cold like hollow characters to me that does the thing that what i think cronenberg does best when you can which is and particularly in videodrome glob on to not a character, but a vibe. Like mm -hmm. you're like, you're not rooting for anybody because look, they're all terrible. We all know that. Like, I think this is a really important thing is like protagonists in this movie, particularly in Cronenberg movies often don't really exist. Like there are main characters, but there's no one who's like protagonist antagonist. Like those levels don't really exist, especially the in main like character these... is usually his own antagonist. It feels like, right? Like it's his own worst enemy type thing, but like, Video drums particular in that like, and I agree, there's no one who's like worth spending more time with than you need to. That's why this movie's a toit 82 minutes. But oh, just rips through, dude. But there's but there's something to that which to me is about why this movie's special in that he is asking us from not the outset but like pretty much. Pretty much the minute the Videodrome feed pops up and we see Max Ring going, oh, yeah, it's pretty hardcore. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's great. Like, <laughs> as soon as he's interested. I got a little stiffy here. Yeah. As soon as he's interested, so are we. And now we're now we're on the we're on the same journey, but we're not Max Ren. We're ourselves. Like he's asking us to be or ourselves in this movie. And that's a fascinating way to make a film because, look, there's like a million and one ways to do it. That is a way that could lose you the audience pretty much immediately at the top of the film. We don't want to think that we're Max Ren. Nobody wants to think they're Max but Ren. We are. Look, I'm not I'm not saying everybody's I'm not saying everybody's capable of murder, but everyone's capable of being their own god, so to speak. Like, I don't care who you are. There is a level of there is a level of omnipotence inside everyone's brain. You're like, well, this is my own small universe, whether it's your house, whether it's anything. So to me, that is where this that is where like the back half of the movie becomes so important and so intense is because Max essentially becomes his own god. They do yeah, they say use the tools they gave you to destroy them. Right. It is kind of a sad fucking state that we live in, though, where everyone thinks they're their own little fucking god. Oh, and it's we're not, terrifying. More and more, we are fragmenting and not sharing realities, which is another Agreed. thing this movie specifically hit on, right? As Max mm -hmm. Ren starts trying to fuck the TV, right? He is becoming, because they even say at the start, right? What if you made a show? What would it be like? Right. And he's like, I don't have the patience for it. The end of the film is us watching what a Max Ren show would look like. Yeah. You know, and so there is this this moment as he's becoming less like when he he thinks he smacks his assistant and he doesn't. Right. That's just something in his mind that he thinks about and wants to do but doesn't act. And as he begins to not be able to tell, right, half reality, half television, hallucinations, and he has no fucking baseline for where he is anymore, right? 
Like he right. sees Masha die in Videodrome, then she's in his bed, but then she's not there. And as you know, the gun fucking grapples to his hand, but then when we see him in the office, there's nothing there. He's just holding a gun. But then right. he goes back outside, and now the gun looks like a fucking dick. Right? And then the TV's got a dick, and it fucking like splooges on him and beats the tape in his t- tummy vagina. <laughs> and we don't know what's happening, right? Bianca Oblivion, right? The screen for her father. Because he's just a library of pre recorded tapes, right? Right, right. His preferred right. method of communication is the monologue. He hasn't had a conversation in 20 years, which I loved because that perfectly right. describes the world we live in. <laughs> yes. And it is, it's like, is she really there? Is she helping deprogram him? Is he, is she some kind of idea in his mind of someone that could fix him? We never fucking know. He's hearing voices that say, kill your partners and give us channel 83. Right. Maybe he's just killing them anyways because they never broke through. We have no fucking context for what is happening in his mind. By the end of the movie, you can say, I think he killed the fucking pirate guy, the pirate king, and I think he killed the optometrist in front of all of his buddies. Definitely. How the fuck do we know? But who not? Well, the whole video like- drum, there might not ever have been a Brian Cor- Cortex or whatever his name is, right? Convex. Convex, that's right. So it it is this fascinating as we as the viewer have authorship of what we think is truly happening. That's what makes the ending so awesome is like... Dude, that that last scene is just fucking amazing. Wait, when he's waiting or like when he goes to the convex convention thing? No, when he's in the fucking like waste yard at the end. When he's in the waste yard, that whole thing. Yeah, like that is... What I'm like, the succession of events though, like when he captain hooks the guy and then blows him up. Which is his like VTR guy, his yeah. uh, his like his tech nerd. Hell yeah, who has like probably one of my all time. And I'll say this: if I ever found a way to like, dude, how about when he's he shoots his partners and he goes, "They killed us," because Video Drone killed their shitty station. That was I'll this say, is great, man. I I don't have a lot of like movie like I don't have a lot of memorabilia, iconography, that kind of thing. I'll say this: if I ever got, if I was ever able to find that flesh tape, yeah, that, hell yeah. Like that shit is fucking rub rad. your dick on it, grow your new flesh. No, I'm uh, you know I'm, you I'm not would watching rub your dick on it. You don't buy the tape from Videodrome and not rub it on your nude body. Maybe you don't, but oh, I would. For sh- I'm not here to hide my like fucking is, self. I would. Do that I know for, sure. for a fact. Like for me, this is why I, this is how I like to interpret it. Is for me, I like to think that Max blew the guy up for sure. Mm-hmm. Then went to the eyeglass convention or whatever the fuck it is, shot that guy in the head with just a regular gun, not the flesh gun that he had. Now, see, like that one's head. more believable than the I eat your fucking hands with my tummy gina right. and then blow you up. Right. So, again. But, like, but here's here's the thing. I think at that point in the movie, this is how I've always And read he just it says, too. see you in Pittsburgh. <laughs> great line, by the way. Great line. James Wood was a always, really great actor. I know he's he kind of a, a dipshit now, but he, he was, was a really a good actor. actor before he did the right wing nut job. Before he got caught, his old flesh is fucking stuck in yeah, Twitter. Before he, he for, before he tried too many times to say hello to the new fleece and that guy needs got, some new fleece. Yeah. Um, but no, what I like, and this is, I've always read it this way, is like the end of the movie is strictly. Like, we shift the point of view. Like, we're not doing this thing. Like, we spent most of the movie doing our own sort of questioning. Mm-hmm. As soon as that scene starts with uh, the VT, with the fucking flesh tape, him putting it in and then getting his hand turned into whatever that thing was, a grenade or something like that. Mm-hmm. I, I thought assumed... it was the tape, like, melded with his skeleton. Oh, it could be. I don't know. I just say, I, whatever. It doesn't really matter. I mean, at the it end of the day. It literally doesn't matter. <laughs> literally doesn't matter the tv but like dick my, fucking ejaculated and his tummy was free and now it's my point it. is i've <laughs> always assumed by that time in the movie we're now actually just in max point of view like we are no longer being subjective at all we're only in max's point of view because we're watching the show he would create right that's what it is that's why like dr convex explodes and bile or whatever the fuck that's whatever he's like turning into ramp it he looks like is it like he's in a meat grinder, rapid, like sausage you know it, meat coming out. You know what it reminded me of is um, Wishmaster when that guy has like rapid onset tumors. Like that's <laughs> right. what it reminded me of. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty gross. It's, it's pretty it's, fucking. It's gross. pretty gnarly. Again, that's like that body horror shit that Cronenberg does better than anybody because you're like, what? 
part of the body yeah. is that? I mean, just the, the fucking sexy TV, the image of the TV where he's like rubbing the tits on top of the TV. It's like, uh, and it cuts back and it's him kneeling in front of this fucking bulging TV. But yep. it's just the beautiful lips on the screen. It's it's fucking perfect. Yeah. Like that is Debbie a Harry, perfect image. Debbie Harry, by the way, inspired casting in this film. It's a She's really, really fascinating thing. Like he knew he just knew people. He knew how to he and I'm, I don't mean to speak about it in the past tense, but. Cronenberg just sort of knows when he's not ca- like like he did this with um with Rabid and with this whereas he's casting actors that maybe you wouldn't traditionally cast like I'm not saying that I can't remember her name the actress from Rabid was a porn star I'm not saying she can't act but she's coming from a very I think different porn stars style. probably have to act a lot <laughs> more than more than most but I, I mean again I... grabbing Deb- grabbing Debbie Harry and putting her in this kind of movie too is really fascinating and also lends itself to another as lends like her casting lends this aspect to the movie and it's like because i mean debbie harry was probably one of the first people who had a music like blondie was one of the first people who had music videos like they were there at the very beginning they were there at the very inception like their aesthetic was very much a part of what became 1980s television essentially so to me that is almost like that's almost this like subtextual note to the viewers like see the lady from Blondie's in this. Are you all just like, and you all know she's fucking beautiful because you're obsessed with her and she's in a weird punk band, but you guys like her because she's hot. Like you're just <laughs> watching this. You're watching this happen now because she's hot. Like again, it's, there's so much awesome stuff that just gets thrown into this movie to remind you to shut your brain off. Essentially. It's, I don't know how else to explain it because you're never shutting your brain off. But it's like Never. trying to do the thing the Videodrome is is doing to its, its viewers, to yeah. its maxes well, of the world. It's when he goes to see the Pirate King, right? And he's like, we'd like to use you, the Pirate King. keep using in, you until you're all gone. Right. Right? That is the journey of this last act, right? I did love the what's in the box. In the box? <laughs> I wonder if that was an inspiration for that. That would be fucking cool. But yeah, I mean, this is when they're trying to use him up till he's gone. You right. could argue that this is a movie that the end of this is his kind of hallucinations flavoring what is just a man who's been used up and he can't go any further. And so he's destroying everything around him, right? Because after his kills, he's on the stage, right? Screaming, uh, you know, death to Videodrome, death long to live Videodrome, the new flesh, right? Long live the new flesh, yep. Just like a hollow fucking saying to chant out into the world, right? <laughs> right. To give some meaning to this fucking kind of, you know, slaughters he's doing. And he goes out to an abandoned shipyard right after he escapes. This is my favorite scene in the movie is this last bit. So he goes out and uh, the TV turns on. And Debbie Harry's character, who we know has been killed by Videodrome, is there. And she's saying, I, I hope I was hoping you would be back. Death is not the end, right? You haven't destroyed them. You need to go to the next phase, right? This evolutionary phase that right. these aren't tumors, but a new organ that mm-hmm. lets us exist in this media landscape, right? This is the next phase of where we're going. In the whole time, it's this him now grappling with all of this hallucinations, right? And being asked right. to make a choice. Will you stay in the real world where you will have to face the consequences of what you did and you're just a man who broke and did bad things? Right. Or do you embrace the hallucination? destroy the old flesh and become this new flesh deity, right? So he is literally put to the point, right? Continue with this fucking destructive television addiction that you have, right? Become a part of, essentially they're becoming their own new video drome, I guess. Right. They're going to be these new media sources that can also affect their viewers. And yeah. he's asked to choose, right? And she even shows him. And when he, she fucking shows him shooting himself and the TV explodes guts, it's amazing awesome and he i again don't know what parts of the body those are i was guessing just intestines i don't know it was just very large chunks of flesh. it's just awesome and that even asked the question still right so he's watching that on the screen we're assuming again that this is his authorship so he watches himself on tv right when he holds the gun up it looks like a tv moment right it's this artistic kind of romanticized version of what he's actually doing 
And I thought when they recreate that in the real world and they don't show him pull the trigger, that that was, there is no romanticism to this decision, right? That this is just a broken fucking mind destroying himself because he can't cope any longer. He wants to continue in the fantasy. And I thought not showing, for a movie that shows everything and more, cutting to black before we hear that gunshot reminds us that none of this is to be romanticized. That this fucking search for more right that just being alive is not enough and you got to go more you got to fucking you got to fuck with giant you know fucking nipple blades and whatever right you got to (laughs) put cigarettes out on your balls right you got to do all this that there it's not to be romanticized right right but the one thing he had is if he had kept that lady and devoted himself to her right he had one human connection in this film right the real flesh the old flesh and he just, they both just keep fucking chasing the flame until they finally catch it. I mean. Neither of them seem like the settling down types. I'm just saying. Sure, it is but the no, one no, actual it. moment in the film. Sure. No, I don't, uh, I don't disagree. I think that there is this level of, um, I don't know. It's hard to watch the movie and not kind of moralize in a way because. Oh, yeah. Again, like, I don't want to. And that's like that free thinker thing is you're like, you have to. But then just like being raised Catholic and uh, in America. So you start immediately going, hmm, I don't know. That's that like bowling for Columbine mentality where like everybody starts pointing at Marilyn Manson, like you were saying. Right. I don't moralize him other than that he becomes a fucking murderer. Right. He starts fucking killing. I mean, that's it. Like, murder is wrong. (laughs) There's nothing about that that's not going to. If you can watch Videodrome in your house. And not hurt anyone. I don't think you're part of the problem unless you're paying for the people that are murdering. Right. But so there, there are a lot there. I mean, this this is a movie about moralizing, right? This is a movie that's specifically saying. This is a movie the fucking about movie off. This is a movie about what the fucking judge your society. This is a movie about what the outer reach of your. It's two. It's a couple of things. Like to me, Videodrome's about how far you're willing to reach for whatever's going to titillate you. For one, it's obviously a it's obviously a metaphor for commercialism in a lot of ways, and about like the crass nature in which. And I'm a part of it. Absolutely, we make TV. It's I've made trash TV. I've made cool TV, but like it's one of those things where like it doesn't matter. Like to me that commercialism is what makes Videodrome palatable for everybody. If you go deeper though, about what we're talking about, to me, it becomes about, it becomes about what you're comfortable sexualizing, I guess. Cause like, to me, like really? to pawn it off as like just murdering, like, yeah, murder's wrong. Like I've never, I'm, I'm, <laughs> never, gonna, I'm never gonna not think that just, so everybody, like, just to be very clear, like murder's not wrong. I'm not okay with that. (laughs) Not okay with people getting murdered. But like Debbie Harry, when Debbie Harry wants him to like show her video drone, like she's like, oh no, it's cool. Like, yeah, it's not porn, but I'll watch like people getting fucking tortured and shit. There's this level of what are you willing to reveal to the world about yourself? Like, and I know that's how she makes her money in the movie. She's like a weird sadomasochist radio host that's what a set of the yeah she's essentially like uh fucking penhead frazier yeah yeah i'm listening (laughs) i'm Um, listening and putting cigarettes out on my clitoris i'm listening to the sights i've shown you Um, (laughs) is that a nipple clamp i heard i'll be right over rub my (laughs) box but to me that's what this is about is like how far you're willing to go to show your true self so like when he says long live the new flesh at the end Maybe his true self is he's just this fucking murdering piece of shit. I don't even know. Yeah, because to me, the the old flesh is we are destroying what it is meant to be a human for the entirety of our existence because of this new we, we've created this this box, this ability to enter new worlds in a way that no right. other form of entertainment had ever right. done to us. We before. are now part of a we're, like the way that entertainment was mm-hmm. was is over because now you can be in somebody's home. And what happens when that TV is a part of your actual brain architecture and right. you can no longer delineate 
what is real and what is fiction, right? Because right. if you're in a fantasy, you can do what he's doing in this movie, and it can be heroic. Right. It can well, be a romantic quest to stop a political fucking upheaval. Well, it's not only that, like it would be even further saying it's not just necessarily what is real and what's a hallucination. It's what are you, what are you, what are you really after? Like to me, that scene where she's like, "I'm going to go to Pittsburgh to find the video." find the video drone people and he gets really upset with her. He's like, don't fucking do that. Like these are not the people to fuck, fuck with. And then by the end of the movie, he's literally like, he's a part of this. He's well, a part of the, he's like, also seeking it out. Right. And right. So, but that's what I'm saying is like, is it a matter of selfishness or is it a matter of exploration? Like that's what the movies to me, that's what the movie's always been trying to figure out is what, uh, what is the pursuit? Well, again, I think this gets back to kind of the the lack of human empathy at the core of the movie is that this is also just a movie about a guy that what what is the point of him just continuing on his path? Right. Just being this fucking strung out, miserable TV exec and just he like they the Videodrome guy said, right, is like, I am just going to use myself up until there's nothing left that there is no kind of human value in this film. That we are all fucking slaughter calves just waiting to find the right hammer. Um, and I, I think that there is this, you know, this <laughs> this pursuit of the danger, right? Mm-hmm. That we are actively seeking our destruction because we do not want to exist in this place anymore. And, you know, that becomes metaphor with the, the television shows. Mm-hmm. But there's something to that. And then you look at the way that, you know, instead of one monolithic TV with a couple networks, now we all have our own micro fucking scalpel specific networks that show us what we want. Right. Right. And the further we pull away from each other and just fucking gorge and indulge on this fucking mindless entertainment, whatever it may be, that are we destroying our own old flesh? Maybe not for the better. And so weirdly, I think this is a movie that is aged exceptionally well, right? Oh, yeah. While you see the, the the icons of the television and the VHS and shit that might throw younger viewers off, the right. concept behind how we interact with our screens is omnipresent in today's world. Yeah. It's, it's brilliant. Again, it's it, it, it hasn't. This is the sad part about how this movie operates. It has not aged. It is still as relevant as it was in 1983. Right. And, Do we all not feel dehumanized and alone, and even though we can reach anyone on Earth a, with the press of a button? As an artist, fucking Cronenberg's the man. As a human being, it's terrifying that this is just, like, totally relevant. Yeah. It's it's just this perfect, <laughs> but it's, it's awesome. fun, it's insightful, it's deep, it's also surface level, level schlock and, you know, gooey goodness. There's a TV that grows a dick and fucking shoots James Wood in the stomach, right? The stomach vagina with the gun has always been fascinating. We never know where we are. It's it's just an absolutely brilliant piece uh, from start to finish. And I fucking love it. And we love it's you awesome. too, Taryn. Thank you for this selection. We're very glad it won a spot on the stocking stuffer lineup. Uh, Good call, thank you, Taren. thank you, thank you. So we have a lot of great movies coming from our patrons this month. If you would like to get in on the fun, Patreon.com slash Film Alchemist Pod. The best way to support the show. The best way to make the show exactly what you want. Uh, Thank you for real, guys, for those of you who do this. At the end of the year, we look back on the year we've had and uh, extra thankful for you guys. So thank you, thank you. Uh, The email, filmalchemistpod at gmail.com. The YouTube, Film Alchemist. Make sure you're leaving those ratings and reviews wherever you find us. Uh, We will be back with another delightful thing to stuff in your stocking. What if your stocking was just a huge fucking vagina? We're going to cram movies in there. A tummy Too vagina? Was, it, was that aggressive? <laughs> Little farewell to old flesh. Bye, old flesh. <laughs>